When I learned that this Sunday was going to have some focus on our Wesleyan heritage, on our, uh, the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, I shared with Kathy something that I had learned recently about Charles Wesley. And so she gave me the opportunity to share that with you today. Um, most of you probably know that the Methodist Church uh, was founded, or at least the founding is, is given to John Wesley, who was an Episcopal or Church of England priest in England. Uh, and you probably also know that he had a younger brother named Charles. Now, just as John was a priest in the Church of England, Charles also had been ordained a priest. Just as John came to this country to serve as a missionary in Georgia, so Charles also came. Uh, John had a, a very unhappy experience here. Charles, who also had an appointment from the government, his experience was not quite so unhappy, but he did return to England before John did. Uh, just as John had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and we have heard about how his heart was strangely warmed, Charles also had such an experience. Um, and so the two of them uh, started a ministry together where they wanted to bring Jesus' love and grace to the common people, to the working people of the day. And as John took the leadership in that movement, Charles became the hymn writer. And you may have heard, or you may know, Charles had more than 4,000 published hymns that he wrote the lyrics for. And by some estimates, he may have written as many as 10,000 hymns. Much of the theology that made its way into the Methodist church and into what we believe was because of what Charles wrote in these hymns and the way they were used in those early services that they did for the working people of England. Um, so, you have sung Charles Wesley's hymns. If you've ever sung, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, or Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, or if you've if you just come on Christmas and Easter and you've sung, Christ the Lord is risen today, you have sung the words of Charles Wesley. Or Hark the Herald Angels Sing. All of those are hymns that were written by Charles Wesley. So I've been singing Charles Wesley hymns, Methodist hymns, for more than six decades now. And in December, I read a biography of him, a short biography that comes into my email in the writer's almanac, and it pointed out a hymn that they called his masterpiece. And it was a hymn I'd never heard of. And I thought, how could I have been singing these hymns all these years and I've never even heard of this hymn that is supposedly his masterpiece? Indeed, I read in, an, in another source, they called it widely regarded as his greatest hymn. So I decided I needed to look this hymn up. And it's called, Come, O Thou Traveler Unknown. So there are a couple of things you need to know about this hymn, because I want to share a little bit of it with you. First of all, Charles Wesley was a master at using scripture in his hymns. And so for this hymn, he turned to the Old Testament, to the 32nd chapter of Genesis, the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel. Now, if you remember that story, Jacob was returning from a land of the pagans, where he had been for probably two decades or more. He had acquired two wives and several children, and they were returning to the promised land. And at night, he sends his family on ahead, and he wrestles with this angel, or some commentators say he actually wrestled with God. In the wrestling, he demands of this being, A, give me a blessing, and B, tell me your name. Now, the other thing you need to know, in ancient Hebrew times, to them, knowing someone's name was very important. Not because only it was a handy way to call them, but also because if you knew someone's name, 
you knew something about their nature, about what they were like. And I think that Jacob, as he returned to this land of his grandfathers, where, where Abraham, the land that God had given to Abraham, I think he wanted to know more about this God that he was going to recommit himself to as he came back to this promised land. So Charles Wesley takes this story, and in this hymn, he also talks about a being and wanting to know that being's name, the Lord's name. Now, Jacob didn't get an answer, but Charles Wesley did. Um, this hymn was oris originally published under the title, Wrestling Jacob, but now it is called, Come, O Thou Traveler Unknown. Um, it actually has 14 verses. You'll be happy to know I'm not going to share all 14 with you. <laughs> But if you want to read all 14 verses, they are found on page 387, or number 387, in the Methodist hymnal. Now, in the hymnal, they have set four of those verses actually to a tune, and that is found on number 386. So if you want to follow along with me, you can, can uh, turn to 386. So this is Charles Wesley's uh, wrestling with the Lord. Come, O thou traveler unknown, whom still I hold but cannot see. My company before is gone, and I am left alone with thee. With thee all night I mean to stay and wrestle till the break of day. I need not tell thee who I am, my misery and sin declare. Thyself hast called me by my name. Look on thy hands and read it there. But who, I ask thee, who art thou? Tell me thy name and tell me now. Yield to me now, for I am weak, my confident in self but confident in self-despair. Speak to my heart in blessing speak. Be conquered by my instant prayer. Speak, or thou never hence shall move, and tell me if thy name is love. Tis love, tis love. Thou died for me. I hear thy whisper in my heart. The morning breaks, the shadows flee. Pure, universal love thou art. To me, to all, Thy mercies move, thy nature, and thy name is love. Thank you, Linda. There are such <clears throat> amazing stories that go behind our scriptures uh, and behind our, our hymns. Uh, Before I read our scripture this morning, I want to remind you that last week we talked about Jesus' first public ministry from the perspective of the Gospel of John, where Jesus, after his mother's nudging, turns water into wine at the wedding in Cana. And this morning, we're going to see the first inaugural act of Jesus' ministry from the writer of Luke's perspective. And friends, they are two very different events. In our reading this morning, Jesus has just been baptized at the River Jordan. You may remember that from our reading a couple of weeks ago. And in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, immediately after Jesus' baptism, he goes into the wilderness for a time. And in both Matthew and Mark, when he comes out of the wilderness, he immediately begins to call his disciples. But for Luke, the calling of his disciples comes later. Our scripture this morning from Luke comes right after he emerges from the time in the wilderness. And we'll talk about that time um, on the first Sunday of Lent. But um, that's where we, where we pick up today. So I will be reading from Luke 4 verses 14 through 21. 
I invite you to either stand for the reading or to rise in your seats. So Jesus has just come back from the wilderness. I'll be reading from Common English Bible. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and he was praised by everyone. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue as he normally do, did, and he stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners, and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the synagogue was fixed on him, and he began to explain to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Will you go with me? Oh, you may be seated. And once you get seated, will you go with me to God in prayer? Oh, gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and accepting to you. For indeed, you are our rock and our redeemer. God, at this time especially, I ask that you help me to step back. Help me to step back and fill me with your spirit so that it is your word, not mine, that is heard. Fill me with your spirit so that it is your word that lands in our heart, so that it is your word that comes back to us throughout the week, so that it is your word that leads us to transformation. God, we ask that you open our hearts and you open our ears to hear your word for our lives. Amen. Well, you may remember that Luke is the gospel where we get that beautiful birth narrative. And then we hear the story of Jesus in the temple with the scholars when Jesus was 12. And in both of those stories, we get such vivid details of those extraordinary moments. Yet for his first public ministry, there is nothing extraordinary Jesus doesn't turn water into wine like he did in the Gospel of John. No, Jesus, like most faithful Jewish men, goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath. And like many men in the synagogue, he gets up and he reads from the scrolls of the Hebrew Bible. And like many men, upon finishing the reading, he sits down in front of the synagogue to expand on the reading that was just heard. Nothing spectacular. In Jesus' first public ministry, he's just being faithful to his upbringing. Luke tells us that after he read, all eyes were fixed on him. See, friends, he is their hometown boy. They know him well. They watched him grow up and they learn and <clears throat> watched him grow up and they watched him learn the trade of carpentry from his father. They saw him in the streets of Nazareth and in the synagogue each week. Now they knew that Jesus had left town a short time ago, and he heard that he was preaching and teaching in Galilee. And word had spread that this guy named Jesus was a pretty good teacher. And he was able to make the ancient scriptures come alive. And now here he was, back in the synagogue where he had grown up as a child where he had come into adulthood. Yes, these people knew him well. So when he sat down to expound upon the scriptures, they were all sitting on the edge of their seats. What would he say? And I can imagine Jesus sitting down and looking at the people that he too knew very well. 
These were the people that had helped shape him. Now, most scholars will agree that before Jesus began his ministry, his earthly father, Joseph, had died, but we don't know when. But maybe, just maybe, some of these men in the synagogue were ones that had taken Jesus under his, their wing and been a mentor to him. Yes, in Jesus' first public ministry, he was home in a familiar place, surrounded by familiar people. And I can imagine that he looked intently and lovingly at them as he said, Today, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. No doubt that was Jesus' shortest sermon ever. And the next verse, which is not part of our lectionary, says... All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yes, the people were amazed and gracious. Now, spoiler alert. This story doesn't have a happy ending, but I am going to leave that to the Reverend Jeff James, who is the executive director of Restore Hope. I am going to leave to him the rest of the story with you next week as he is our guest preacher. So we're just going to focus on the scripture read this morning. In our scripture this morning, Jesus says, today, today, those scriptures that were written over 700 years ago for the people then, and over 2,700 years ago for us, today, those scriptures have been fulfilled. Those scriptures that you have heard so many times have now been fulfilled. Oh, friends, that is a bold and courageous move by Jesus. Because now, in his first recorded act of ministry in Luke's gospel, Jesus has just publicly declared his mission statement. Jesus has publicly stated his purpose. There was no doubt from here on out what the focus of Jesus' ministry was from the perspective of the Gospel of Luke. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. In the Gospel of Luke, the role of the Holy Spirit is such an important part of Luke's Gospel. Remember two weeks ago when we heard Jesus' baptism, Luke tells us, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. And then the writer tells us that after that moment, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where he stayed for 40 days. And then immediately to this morning scripture that begins with, then, then Jesus filled with the Spirit returned to Galilee. And then Jesus reads the scripture that begins, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Yes, friends, Luke wants to be sure that we know that Jesus is filled with God's Spirit. And now that he's filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus is clear why he came, to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus first declares to those who know him best his mission statement. He is saying to his hometown people, this is what God has called me to do. And friends, if that is Jesus' mission statement, as Christians, it becomes our mission statement as well. Why did Jesus call the disciples? 
Why does Jesus call us? So that we may continue the work that Jesus began, to bring forth God's kingdom to all, and to make sure that those in society who are often overlooked, and those who have been oppressed by systematic injustices, and those who have lost sight of God's goodness, that those can have abundant life in the here and the now. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, ooh, Kathy, that's a tall order. That's what Jesus was called to do. But not us, not me. I can't do that. And friends, you are right. On our own, we can't do that. And even Jesus didn't do it on his own. Luke tells us repeatedly that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, that it is the Spirit of God in him that was his motivation and his driving force. And my friends, we are given that very same Spirit. Two weeks ago when we remembered our baptism and we reaffirmed our baptismal vows, Part of those vows were, is that we will allow, we will make room in our lives for the Holy Spirit to work in us so that God can work through us. And friends, do you realize, do you realize how powerful that is? The very same Holy Spirit that filled Jesus is the same Spirit of God that we are given. You see, friends, it's not like gasoline. There aren't different levels of the Holy Spirit. There's not a low level with a low octane level. There's not a mid-grade with a higher level. And then there's not this premium level that only Jesus gets. No, friends, there is only one high-grade premium level Holy Spirit. And when we open ourselves up, we all get all of us get the premium level. You see, friends, that is the promise of our baptism, and that's the promise of our life in Christ. The promise that that high-grade, premium, premium-level Holy Spirit allows us, compels us, open doors for us, and to continue the work that Jesus began to bring forth God's goodness, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, and love to those who need it the most. Yes, filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus' ministry began, and it continues through us. Now, let me jump ahead for a minute to go from the beginning of Jesus' ministry to the end. As Jesus is preparing his disciples to continue his ministry after he's gone, he tells them, He looks at his disciples and he tells them, that same spirit that lives in me will live in you. That same spirit, my friends, that lived in Jesus as he walked this earth lives in us today. And he told his disciples that through that spirit, they will be able, we will be able to do things greater than even Jesus. How how can that be? Because, my friends, we have been given that high-grade, top-tiered, premium level of the Holy Spirit, and we have been given community. You see, we have this community of faith that encourages us, this community of faith that reminds us whose we are, and who we are. And friends, that is a combination that ensures that Jesus' work continues. Today, today, this scripture has been fulfilled. Today is the favor of the Lord. Today, today. Today, in the midst of a pandemic, today, in the midst of racial tension and political unrest, today, in the midst of destruction of natural disasters, and today, with wars throughout our world and the civil unrest, today, with increasing rates of gun violence and increasing rates of 
death by suicide and increasing rates of mental illness. Today is the favor of the Lord. Today, with elected officials trying to make it harder for those who are less privileged to be able to vote. And today, with hate-filled words spewing all over social media. Today, today, this scripture is fulfilled because God's people Friends, that's you and me, that's us. Because God's people continue to live out Jesus' mission statement, to bring forth God's goodness in whatever way we can. Today, not tomorrow, not the next day, not when the pandemic ends, but today. Today, fueled by the Holy Spirit. Today, my friends, we can each do something, one thing or a multitude of things to show that God's goodness is on earth as it is in heaven. See, my friends, the Apostle Paul tells us that there are many, many gifts that we have, but there is only one Spirit. And friends, God has given each of us our own unique gifts, but God has given us each the same spirit. Some of you have been given the gift of music, the gift of kindness, the gift of teaching, the gifts of being in the medical profession. Some of you, God has given the gift of generosity, of vision, an ability to fix things. Some of you have been given a gift that you're able to see a need and then know what to do. Some of you have been given that gift of being warm and welcoming. Some of you have been given that gift of cooking a home-cooked meal and sharing it with someone in need. Yes, my friends, as a community, we have all been given different gifts, but putting them to use is the same fuel of the Holy Spirit. And so friends, today, on this day, mark my words, God is going to use you and God is going to use us to bring good news to someone who needs to hear it or see it or experience. You see, my friends, today, is a God-filled day, a day to be embraced even during the difficult times, a day to be embraced even during the times when you are exhausted and you feel like you have nothing left to give, a day to be embraced even during those times when yesterday sure seemed like a much better day today. Because today, is the day in which the Holy Spirit is living and moving and breathing in you. And friends, remember that when today turns into tomorrow, it's a new today. The day to be embraced because it's the day that God has said, you, you are my beloved. You are my beloved and I have filled you with my high grade, premium level, top tiered spirit so that you, so that you may have abundant life and so that you may share that abundant life with others. Friends, last week when we talked about Mary nudging Jesus into changing the water into wine, I ask you to spend some time thinking about the people in your life that have nudged you to step out of your comfort zone to do God's work. This week, this week, I want to encourage you to pay attention to the nudges of the Holy Spirit, that part of God that lives and moves and breathes in you, that same part of God that filled Jesus so that he could stand up in the synagogue and proclaim his mission and then live out his mission and to stay true to that mission even though it led him to his death on the cross. Pay attention, friends. Pay attention to how that spirit nudges you and then pay attention to how you respond. Yes, friends, it is the spirit that compels us to bring God's kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. Linda mentioned a John Wesley focus today because one of my favorite, favorite John Wesley quotes 
<clears throat> is this. He says, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. In other words, John Wesley was saying, let God's Holy Spirit work in you and work through you in all the ways that it can. Oh, friends, as a church, may we be guided by the power, by the enthusiasm, by the unfailing steadfastness of the Holy Spirit to do all the good that we can on this very day. I am looking forward, friends, to seeing where God's Spirit leads us as we proclaim through all that we do that indeed this is the year of the Lord's favor. May it be so. It is in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother to us all. Amen. Our hymn of response is more like you. Friends, may we pray that every day we will be more like Jesus and let God's Spirit work in us. Let's sing two times. One of the things that John Wesley believed was that it was important to constantly be renewing our relationship with Christ. And the prayer that is in the bulletin at the bottom of More Like You is his Wesley Covenant prayer. My friends, it is a powerful, powerful prayer. And I invite you to keep it near you. And when you have the courage to pray it, pray it because indeed it is a life-changing prayer. I invite you now to join me in this prayer. Let's read it in unison. O Creator, I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. Amen. You are mine and I am yours. <laughs>